come south with us into the sunshine. You'll be in the best of company. Winston Churchill made the same journey. In fact, it was he who reminded the world of Marrakesh, this fabulous town of the south. Half African, half Saharan, where life meanders on today as it did a thousand years ago when Sultan Abu El Akbar made it his capital. That is Marrakesh. In the distance, the snow-capped Atlas Mountains shine blue in the sun. Cutting off the town from mountain and desert is an unbroken wall. It was built centuries before by chain gangs of prisoners, captured by the warrior sultans of Marrakesh, or sold to them by the pirates of the Moroccan coast. And then, startling in its unexpectedness, you see the other side of Marrakesh. Here is the Manunia Hotel, where Churchill stayed. Supermodern, it sports every refinement of a mechanical age an oasis of the 20th century in concrete and glass and formal gardens. It is surrounded by a people who look as you imagined they did in Bible times. In Marrakesh, even in the depth of winter, oranges glow like golden glass balls. The sun shines on the date palms, and the wide streets of the European quarter look cool and inviting. Though even here, the old breaks in on the new. The patient donkey trots on a surface designed for limousines. You pass women wearing the traditional yasmak, women whose face no man except their husband must ever look upon. The donkey is king of the road here, but there is some modern transport. Not quite like a British bus, perhaps, but there are no luggage restrictions. And if you prefer to stand on the top deck, no one will stop you. In the streets, Many colored robes mingle with the older fashioned white and the children wear their hair shaven with this peculiar twisted pigtail. But if you seek the real Marrakesh, you must leave the European quarter with its thin veneer of the present day, past the palaces and the mosques, towards the souks and the bazaars of the native quarter. Here in a labyrinth of narrow streets, the hours fly quickly. Overhead, Rush mats stretched across the streets break up the sun's rays. In the souks of Marrakesh you can buy almost everything, except soap, which for some reason is unobtainable. A servant hired here costs practically nothing, and if you know where to go, you can still buy a slave, though officially slave trading is illegal. Padding barefoot through the shaded streets, the ordinary folk of Marrakesh do most of their shopping in the souks. Even here, the West has caught up with them. On show are the latest things in underwear. And exported, let's hope, from Birmingham, a batch of kitchen equipment. Alongside the new, squatting behind his wares, is the spice cellar. green grocer and the careful customer who isn't going to be overcharged they're all there part and parcel of Marrakesh and there's something curiously familiar about the shops the salesmen and the shoppers in the local China shop for instance the housewife is cautious and the shopkeeper uses gestures you can see any day in a British market Marrakesh, time has paused in its tracks. To travel there by plane from London is an experience rather like going to sleep in one's own bed and waking up in the time of David and Goliath and the prophets of the Bible. Prominent figures in the marketplace are the doctors. They display few medicines but a multitude of charms. Among them are animal hides, lizard skins, jackal's teeth. The teeth are supposed to make their owner irresistible to women. Around the streets, some refuse to have their pictures taken, especially the makers of opium pipes. But most have never seen a camera before. Every street has its quota of beggars, but the marketplace seems to be their gathering ground. 
Quite near and as busy as the narrower streets of the souks, you find the orange market. Thousands of cases, some of them perhaps destined for Britain, are examined and priced. After long haggles, they change hands, and the sellers go back to their groves to replenish their stocks from the loaded trees. It's hungry work, even for the successful bargainers. Favourite dainties are a Moroccan version of the Indian chapati, this time flied in oil. Money is hard earned in Marrakesh, but if there are a few francs to spare, ten to one it goes to the seller of Arabian mint tea. All kinds forgather in this strangers of public meeting places, and when business is done, the snake charmer holds the crowd a little longer. The routine has been the same for many hundreds of years. Probably it will not change for many hundreds more. The high spot of the act comes when the cobra takes the stage. Its evil looking flat hood bringing new thrills to an audience which has probably seen it all before. Then there's the star comedian of Marrakesh. With a dance routine and a gift of expression, it'll be hard to beat. No less colorful is the grain market. All the East is here. The East of the Arabian Nights with its romance and mystery, and rubbing shoulders with it, the grasping, bargaining, flea-bitten East of the street traders. question here of, if you don't want the goods, don't maul them. Everyone tries the grain out carefully before buying. If you find you've been tricked, it's no good coming back to complain. In the background, the old men argue endlessly. They do this every day, and no one knows who cheats whom. For all the charm of its shabby, sprawling, exciting streets and buildings, the true magnificence of Marrakesh is its people. Here you find the rugged Arab of the Sahara, Standing beside him, you may find the gentle-featured southern Berber or the dark-skinned half-Negro from the Niger Valley. These people and the fantastic mixture of their races have produced a type quicker-minded and more vigorous than can be found anywhere in the Sultan's empire. Though they are supposed never to be seen by Western eyes, Arab writers speak of the beauty of the women of Marrakesh. Certainly they walk with great dignity, their babies slung at their backs and carrying heavy loads on their heads. So it is after a few hours in Marrakesh, the wonder remains. To return from it to the calm of the Mamounia Hotel is to step over 900 years. The town's unending charm explains why, when this film was made, Winston Churchill had chosen it for a much-needed rest. He said of Marrakesh that it was the most beautiful place on earth, a judgment few will question. Britain and austerity seemed part of another world. The lush and beautiful gardens and the quiet snow of the Atlas Mountains beckon us back, recalling the words its people say, he who has once seen Marrakesh must always return. Uh -huh.